He's kind of progress. Okay. Um, I'm so honored to be here and share a bit about what I learned while writing Tales from an Uncertain World. And I'm so excited about the discussion we're about to have because I, I feel like this panel of, of people have such, uh, you know, really exciting backgrounds. And so I, I'd love for them to just all talk for an hour, but that would be a very long panel. Um, so as uh, Betty mentioned, I work in an education group at UCAR which is associated with the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And uh, in this job, I spent many years helping people understand the science of climate change, as well as other calamities. Um, and I'd explain what was happening, focusing on the science and of our planet and how it was changing. And I noticed that people would often look a bit like this guy here, um, somewhat paralyzed with fear and anxiety. Uh, and if you're hearing about an entirely unsustainable global situation, it's quite natural uh, that this would be leading to worry, but uh, worry, uh, if worry is causing people to be paralyzed uh, and by a situation, uh, that's not very helpful uh, to solve a global catastrophe. So um, I wrote this book because I wanted to look at how we deal with environmental change to understand more about why we aren't reacting quickly to climate change. And I wanted to help people and non-experts in particular think about how they uh, as individuals perceive different types of hazards, including climate change. In some ways, climate change is unique, um, but we have coped with other types of environmental change. So I wanted to figure out what our strengths are, where our weaknesses or blind spots are. Um, and what I learned was that our reactions to environmental change whether climate change or volcanic eruptions or um, coastal erosion, all sorts of things, our reactions depend on how we deal with uncertainty. And we don't all deal with it the same way. Um, for instance, some people will deal with uncertain information by saying that we should do nothing because we don't know everything. Uh, other people will deal with uncertainty by imagining everything that could possibly go wrong. I tend to fall into that camp. Um, and also we don't all define the word uncertainty in the same way. Scientists and non-scientists use uh, the word in different ways and this can cause some confusion. Um, so to illustrate this, I did a Google image search of the word uncertainty, and I came up with images like this, and like this, and this one's my favorite. I love this one. And all these images I found were unpleasant um, or uncomfortable or just scary. And in science, uncertainty isn't some sort of wishy-washy feeling of not being sure what to do or what, where to go. It's not a lack of direction like this fellow seems to be um, experiencing. Uh, scientists describe uncertainty to articulate how sure we are of something, which um, if you are a researcher who communicates uncertainty, you might wanna know that it sounds a little backwards to people to um, communicate how much you know about something by communicating how little you don't know about something. Anyway, it, it sounds a little backwards, but for example, this quote from the IPCC uh, includes this little touch of uncertainty um, in the phrase extremely likely. And uncertainty is communicated so that people know what's known and what's not yet known. It's very important to communicate it, but uncertain information can make it very difficult to make decisions. And we all interpret uncertainty differently, which means that we don't all make the same decisions based on uncertain information. So in this book, I went on a quest, a disaster quest, uh, to learn how people are dealing or have dealt with different types of environmental change, how they parse uncertainty to make decisions and what to do about it. And, um, and what that can tell us about how we're dealing with climate change. I just, I love a good analogy. And so these uh, environmental changes were all used sort of in the spirit of uh, how are they analogous to climate change and our reactions there? And during the making of this book, um, all my vacations somehow became very disaster related. Uh, 
my um, very understanding spouse went along with this. Um, but even when I wasn't looking for environmental change, I started to see it just everywhere. Um, and then I found myself having a disaster staycation uh, in that last bullet on the list here uh, during the flash floods in 2013 in Boulder, Colorado and the surrounding area. And that was a little bit of a turning point for the making of this book. Um, so here's uh, a bike path along Boulder Creek in the middle of Boulder, Colorado. If you're not from around here, it's a, a city of about 100,000 people northwest of Denver. And this photo is looking west, so you can just barely see the foothills um, in the background there of the Rocky Mountains. Um, but this is usually what the scene looks like. But in September of 2013, it looked like this. Um, we got about half a year of rainfall in a week. And um, when the floodwaters receded, when the immediacy of the disaster was behind us, I went back to the drafts of the chapters I'd already written. And I realized that what I'd been documenting was really how we as individuals make decisions as the environment changes and how that can apply to climate change. And of course, with climate change, global and national policies are really important too, of course. But my line of inquiry in this book was looking at what humans as individuals do or don't do and what we feel. And it turns out that our feelings as opposed to analysis of facts tend to be in charge when deciding what actions to take. Uh, We'll come back to that. But one thing I found was that um, what we do and feel as the environment changes depends on how we think about nature and our ideas about our relationship with nature and the value we place on nature. Um, so here is a very simplistic graphic from a kid's video that portrays nature and human-made, or as they call it, man-made environments as completely separate. Somehow also non-living things are all kind of like Ikea furniture and living things are found outdoors. But um, in this you know, situation, some people do think that of these things as completely separate and other people think of them as part of the same system. And if you see the human made world and the natural world as being part of the same system, you're gonna be more likely to value nature and see the impacts of climate change as hazardous and understand how climate change threatens us and, and you as an individual, um, because we're not really outside the system. And the, the analogy that I like to use for this is it's like being in a 3D movie. If you're wearing your 3D glasses, you're gonna flinch when someone throws something at you. But if you're not wearing your 3D glasses, you're not gonna flinch because you know you're not in that situation. And so this is like a major dividing line um, here, but, uh, in this book, and I was trying to sum up as if this was some sort of scientific study, but um, I did make a summary slide of realizations that I had uh, as I was putting the book together. And one big one is that how we handle other types of change can help us understand our strengths and weaknesses when it comes to dealing with climate change. Um, how we deal with climate change depends on what we value, how we perceive risk, how prone we are to rationalization and how we cope with uncertainty. Because we don't all deal with emergencies in the same way, we'll never be in total agreement about what to do about climate change. And then something that I like to tell all the audiences that I talk to, but probably makes sense to this group, um, is that this should not stop us from solving the problem. But there's one idea um, that came out of this book project that really reshaped the way I help people learn about hazards. And so I wanted to share it with this particular group. And that's the, the analytical parts of our brain are what we tend to lean on to interpret global climate data or any sort of environmental data. And um, that's not the part of our brain that's prone to jumping into action. Uh, it's the emotional part of our brain that does the jumping into action. And so global data or even global images like this earth from space can seem really abstract, um, even if you know what they are. Uh, they don't appear to include all of us and our day-to-day -day realities. Um, and so now I look for ways in both my education projects and my writing projects to make those connections between what the planet is doing and what we humans are doing 
uh, to get both the analytical and the emotional parts of people's brains engaged and also help see global problems at a very human scale. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And if we were together in a room, I know that we would give you a huge round of applause. So I'm loving the emojis that are popping up across the screen. Um, thank you for your incredible words. And I really felt like your story personalized the unimaginable. And next up, we'll hear from Madeline Beal. Thank you. Um, and I, I should say I, I am a federal employee, so I can't endorse the book, but I enjoyed the book. Uh, I think I'm allowed to say that from a personal perspective. Um, and I welcome the opportunity to, to be here and talk with you guys about, about it. Um, I, I will frame sort of my comments around what my role is at EPA. Um, so I'm going to give you just a little bit on that uh, to start out with, but I'm the senior risk communication advisor for the agency. Um, and, and that's, it's a big job. Um, I, I would argue um, for an agency like EPA, where our mission is to protect human health and the environment, almost everything we do is risk communication. Um, and it's really no more, nowhere more challenging than when I think about climate change, right? I mean, this is the, the existential crisis of the planet's history, right? And uh, we have an agency that it's, I mean, it's really fundamentally our job to try to help protect that from, from uh, you know, that path from, from, from not going as badly as it could. Um, and so when I read the book, I sort of had that lens on this, right? Like what, what is the risk communication? And it's a lot of it, right? I mean, as I think Lisa was already explaining, right? Risk communication is a big piece of it. There's more besides risk communication in this book, um, but that's, that's the part that I'll sort of focus my comments on. Um, I, at EPA, one of the things that we do is we run a training course with Compass Science Communication, and I don't know if you guys uh, have any familiarity with them as a, as a group, um, but I found myself thinking a lot about this idea of, of so what um, when I was reading this book, which is a, an idea that comes from, from my work with Compass, and, and I think they, they sort of coined that phrase as a way to think about science communication as speaking to someone's um, so what, right? Why does this matter to an individual? And I think it's so hard on something that's as big and global um, as climate change to think about how do you get to individualize so what. Um, but I think I saw in the book through the stories that Lisa was, was telling that that really is the way that we have to move forward. We have to find a way to do a better job speaking to folks so what. Um, Lisa also called out uncertainty in her presentation, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the book. Um, so, you, you know, my second my second sort of theme here is is on a second after uncertain after so what is on uncertainty. Um, when I think there's research to indicate, I mean, I could probably could probably find some citations if if I if I were called upon. Uh, but I think there's research to indicate that the best way to speak to uncertainty from a science communication perspective is to explain what you know to explain what you know, don't, and then to explain why that informs your current recommendation. Um, I find when I work with scientists at EPA, um, we tend to go the other way around. Um, and I think, I think the, the field of science trains us to go the other way around, right? Um, but it's to lead with your uncertainty to say, well, here are all the potential problems with the method that I used um, and all the things that we don't really know. And then only at the very end do you get to the point where you say, well, this is why, why I think uh, this is what it, what it means. Um, and so I, I really do, I, I, when I work with our scientists to try to get us to, to get past that uncertainty, it's, it's to try to work, to speak first to what we know, right? Um, and and I, we just have a lot of trouble with that, I think, as scientists. Um, and I think that's one of the quintessential problems with, with this issue, right? And I think that's clear in the book as well. Um, I, I think it sort of played out in many of the examples that Lisa gave. Um, my fifth question, or my, my, uh, my third point here, it looks at this idea of um, systems versus individual response. Um, and in, in the book, for those of you who've read the book, hopefully most of you have, um, there's, a, there's a chapter on um, the lionfish and, and this idea of this growing social movement to try to, to kill off the lionfish directly and to actually eat them, right? Um, and I, I do, I mean, I, I see a lot of parallels with that and climate change, um, but it, it's not the most optimistic parallel um, because I'm not sure... Um, how we get to a place where we have more system, 
systemic change without that individual sort of push. Um, and I'm not, I mean, I, I, I at least doesn't have all the answers in the book. I will, I will, uh, I will say that I was hoping for something a little more optimistic, but, uh, but it was good. It was, it was definitely a good uh, review. Um, but I wonder if there are lessons that we could learn from sort of other big social movements um, beyond even environmental change, right? So maybe it's a, a war movement or a movement for, um, for equality, you know, you know, the 60s. Maybe there's something we could learn from those sorts of big social movements that have really changed the world um, to, to help us better understand how to get, or even if you just think about how we got to a place where we have an internet that allows, you know, lots of people to play a role. There may be something more in those spaces. Um, and then um, I also, I, I feel like I have just sort of a list of things here, but they are, they, they sort of frame together in my mind a little bit, but I, I was also thinking a lot about COVID when I read this book. Um, and I don't know, I, I assume you sort of wrote it a, a bit before sort of COVID played out. Um, but I think there's some lessons there too, right? And I, I found myself reading the chapter on Vesuvius and thinking about how, how some people very much reacted that way towards COVID, even in the modern era, right? Like you see something blowing up and instead of like staying home, you decide you're going to go out and go into it. Um, and, and I, it is disheartening, um, but I also think there's some answers in there, right, for how we might have to step outside of our way of thinking instead of just saying this is what the science says, right, and you're a dummy to not believe it. Um, we know that doesn't work. Um, and so I, I, I would hope we would think a little more about identity, right, and think about the plenty of the elder and plenty of the younger. Um, and, and how we can actually reach those folks who that's their response is like, either I'm curious about this and I wanna go see it up close, or I just don't believe anything any expert is ever gonna tell me. Um, but there are still probably ways to reach them, right? And it's to speak to their identities um, and to speak to their, um, their core values um, and, and getting to a place of shared values. Um, you spoke a bit about risk perception as well. Um, and I, this is a debate that I often find myself having with folks. I feel like I'm having it less now than I, I did in the last administration. Um, uh, but this idea of whether or not we need to actually get people to believe that climate change is man-made um, and, and whether or not we could get all the same actions um, without that. And I would, I would actually look to the risk perception research to say that I, I think it um, it's not just a matter of what the actions need to be taken, it's actually a matter of how we perceive the risk, right? There's lots of evidence to suggest that we perceive risks that are man-made to be much more alarming and to need much more action. Um, and so if we believe this is natural, it's much more likely for people just to say, well, it's naturally occurring. There's, and I wish I could know, know the researcher's name, um, but I can't think of it right now, but there was some really interesting research I, that NIEHS funded looking at, um, they were trying to get folks to install uh, filters on their wells for arsenic, um, but they couldn't get anybody to be interested in arsenic. I mean, there was huge levels of arsenic in this, in this area. It was up in Vermont, um, but nobody was interested, but they were all worried about PFAS, right? And there was no PFAS there. I mean, they couldn't find any PFAS there. But they found that if they went out and talked to people about PFAS and arsenic together, because the solution is the same for both of them, right? They could get people to install the, the filters to protect themselves from PFAS when really the risk that was a concern was arsenic. And I think that just speaks to like this fear we have of man-made things versus natural things. Um, and so I don't think it's a semantic point uh, on climate change. Um, and so I, I know you spent a little bit of time thinking of talking about sort of the data on on, on who believes whether it's man-made or not. But I, I do think it's something that we need to consider as a, as a field. Um, I just have one sort of more, one more takeaway and then, and then a, a, a couple of closing thoughts. But my, my final sort of takeaway point from this is, um, you know, I, I feel like we need more narrative storytelling where the protagonist is a chicken little, right? Or the protagonist is the little red hen that actually prepares and nothing happens, but they have a nice meal at the end, right? Um, and there has to be a way to build those stories so that they still feel like a hero you can identify with. I mean, you mentioned um, Gilbert White in the book and his role in sort of helping prevent disaster in Boulder. 
Um, but there are lots of people like that that have gone through and helped us make good decisions. Um, and maybe we need to do more to sort of reclaim their stories as stories of, of heroism. Um, because it's, you know, you do always hear the stories of like the person who runs into the fire, but what we really need are the stories of the people that prevented the fire from happening, right? Um, so the final thing I will close on is, is on sort of how I think this could sort of come back to, to my role, right? You know, at EPA, fundamentally risk communication, I mean, really everywhere, risk communication is about improving decision-making, right? It's about helping our audiences make choices. Um, but I think in order to do that, we do, we have to think about their feelings. We have to think about these issues of risk perception. Um, and we really need better science um, to help us understand not the uncertainty in the models of the warming, although I think we do need better science on that too, but to help us understand how to reach those people that are likely to rush into the fire um, and, and help them in a different way, perhaps, than we help um, the folks who are most of us on this call, I assume, are, are sort of the folks who are already worried, right? Um, but how do we help the folks who are already worried, but also the folks that, um, that are not? And I, and I think it's 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 all going to come down to splitting our audiences a little better and and doing better science to understand where they're coming from. Did I go over? No, oh, perfect. You ended just exactly at our time schedule. So thank you so much, Madeline. And I am so excited to hear your suggestions um, in your comments about you know, how we do this storytelling and how we talk about risk and how we communicate our findings. So thank you. And I will give you a little congratulations <laughs> emoji. Next up, we are going to hear from Lily Bui. Aloha, everyone. It's so nice to be on this panel. Thank you so much for having me. Um, for context, I'm, um, I'm currently working at the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center at the University of Hawaii. Um, and for those of you who don't know us, our center has a congressional authorization to develop and deliver education and training on disaster management to first responders, emergency managers, government agencies, higher education institutions, community organizations, and others who work in resilience. Um, and one thing that's really unique about our center is that we approach this field from a planning perspective. Um, and so usually what that means is we're very interested in turning knowledge that's generated through research um, and knowledges from, you know, for example, indigenous populations and other groups and translating that into action and what can be done. Um, so hopefully that frames the way that I'm giving you this commentary on Lisa's book. Um, and about Lisa, she and I have a history together. Um, at one point during our past lives, we worked for the same citizen science blog. Um, so I, I wanna say that I just have such admiration for her. And um, we had a call before this forum to kind of talk through some of the main points that we wanna bring out. But she is a person who contains multitudes and always straddles this line between um, art and science and everything in between and her interdisciplinary approach to what she does is really what makes this book special and unique. Um, so what I want to do is start with, you know, the general and um, go through some macro level comments I have about the book and then talk about this recurring theme that I really appreciate, which is that of individual action and agency um, and highlighting some of the examples that Lisa goes through in her book. Um, and then I'll close with some thoughts and comments from my perspective, and that'll be informed very much so by um, the hat that I wear as a planner working for our center. So um, I'm really glad that Lisa uh, highlighted this theme of uncertainty. So we're starting with the macro level. I think that's probably the most important word in the book's title. The entire book to me reads as though it's a meditation on uncertainty itself at this global scale and what's happening to the planet, our contribution to it as human beings who inhabit it, and what to deal, what to do to deal with the, the emotional aftermath of that. Um, and I love that Lisa frames uncertainty as this inherent part of the scientific process, but also uncertainty as a symptom of the chaos that this planet is enduring. Um, and so she takes us through all of these different perspectives and hazards uh, from erosion, earthquakes, ecology, oceans, fossils, volcanoes, floods, and at the end we go almost into outer space. <laughs> and this is 
really important because it connects this hazards paradigm to what we know in our field as this, um, this study of disasters and connecting it to climate change. They're not necessarily seen as the same thing. Sometimes we see disasters as a function of climate change and these more sudden onset events that are separate. Um, and sometimes in policy, they, they end up in completely different strains. There's some funding that goes to climate change adaptation and some funding that gets allocated specifically for disasters and their response and recovery. But in this book, we see them as one in the same. And Lisa characterizes climate change as the disaster itself that we're responsible for. And it is slow going. It's a creeping hazard that we're trying to deal with on an ongoing basis. And she writes, um, and this, I think this passage connects the two things together very well. She writes, to recognize a catastrophe, we must be able to perceive risk and how we perceive risk depends on cultural and psychological factors, our values and our way of living. And to me, this really paints the emotional core of the book. Um, I, I think unlike most other books that are dedicated to more scientific audiences, this is really written for a general audience and it's supposed to reach as far and wide as it can um, to resonate with individuals who are trying to look for the answer of what can I do? Um, and so I love that Lisa highlighted people make decisions, not so much based on the analytical side of their brain, but how they feel and their emotions. Um, and so uh, I, I love the, the analogies too to Wiley Coyote, because in the Anthropocene, you know, we're in this, this moment, which she describes as the pause, you know, where we are Wiley Coyote, we are looking at the chasm beneath us. And we've paused and we have this opportunity to decide, you know, what do we believe? What do we value? What are the psychological factors at play? And how does this affect our way of living? Um, perhaps before this catastrophe um, and this calamity. And so um, I want to now focus on this theme of individual action and agency, which I think is Lisa's answer to all of this uncertainty. But I want to start with this scene that really resonated with me um, that illustrates the type of paralysis that people often feel when they're talking about climate change. It's the scene in New England, um, or I might get there, I might have the location wrong, but it's um, the scene with her nephew um, in chapter two, when she reflects on how to describe erosion to her nephew, Justin. And I think many of us grapple with this when we're writing our journal articles or research papers of, you know, there's this guilt that's attached to, wow, there's something huge at play, we're responsible for it. And how do you cope with the emotional weight um, of climate change and describing the science of it, but also recommending some sort of action? Um, I think we sometimes get paralyzed by this indecision and this uncertainty about what we should actually do and whether it's the right thing or not. Um, and also humans have these abilities to you know, rationalize and mentally time travel. I love the term chronesthesia, Lisa, um, and mentally escape from these things that we should be responsible for. But the, the moments of individual and collective action or the examples that she paints, I think are very meaningful in showing that there's always something to do at the individual scale. So there's, you know, the carbon accounting that she does at the end of her own book as an author, you know, this is the carbon footprint of this book. And I actually laboriously went through and looked at what it took to produce it and the flights and everything. And her personal responsibility is an example for us of how we can take action and understand for ourselves our responsibility. And then there's the moving of the lighthouse on Cape Cod, which is an illustration of collective action of a community that organized in order to decide, okay, what is the fate of this lighthouse? Why do we care about it? What should we do with it? Um, or Lisa's own, you know, citizen science initiatives in logging sightings of invasive lionfish species in the Caribbean or similar projects like that. Um, and even, you know, thinking about the clams and the snails that Lisa um, studied during her, her graduate career um, as living proof that change is possible and adaptation is possible when the climate is changing. Um, and so I think that for me, looking at the book as a whole, um, I'm moving into my closing thoughts now, the, the more important themes I think this book touches on are the emotions that go with climate change. There's the fear, 
there's the discomfort, there's hope, there's curiosity, there's wonder. And one really wonderful aspect of the book is its sense of humor about it all. Um, in, in the way that we can approach things, not so much from a doom and gloom perspective, but how do we cope with this on an everyday basis and, and live with ourselves and learn how to craft a better future? Um, and so the future is characterized as not necessarily a, a utopia, but it doesn't have to be a dystopia either. Um, and this to me kind of connects to these themes that we come up with again and again at this workshop for our field um, in this dichotomy between what keeps us up at night and what's worth getting up for in the morning. Um, and so we tend to focus very much so in the hazards community on who's most vulnerable. Um, and I think that we can take the lessons learned from Lisa's book and translate them into to action to focus on who's most disproportionately affected by disasters, who's most vulnerable to them and what can be done to better reach them from a risk communication perspective, but also policy and many other things. Um, and to really remember that people do make decisions at the individual behavior level based on how they're feeling and how do we acknowledge the complexity that comes with that, perform the due diligence that we're responsible for as researchers and try to think about tomorrow and how we make better decisions tomorrow than we did yesterday and imagine the best of ourselves in this climate change prone world. Um, I hope I didn't go over time um, and I'll, I'll end it there and pass it on to our next panelist. Thank you so much, Lily. And I think it's a beautiful call to action in your own words too. And so amazing to see how we're all reading the same work but have our own reactions as well to Lisa's work. Um, next up, we have Sarah McBride. Um, that was wonderful. I, I I feel sort of like I'm not sure what I have to add. Um, first of all, uh, like Margaret, I have to say, first of all, I, I am not, I'm a federal employee. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey and the Earthquake Science Center. I'm a research social scientist there. Let me say, I, I'm not allowed to endorse this book in any way. Uh, so please take my statements as personal opinion and not re representative of the federal government. As far as I know, the federal government does not read books for enjoyment, at least that I'm aware of. And uh, I certainly did on a personal level, enjoy this book. Um, so my main impression is that it felt really like a travelogue of interesting places with unique pasts and challenges and where communities and individuals had worked together to meet these challenges as a way to provide hope, which I think is really critical when we're talking about the climate change. And I'm not sure if it was purposeful or not, but it accidentally made for an excellent travel guide for places to visit as well. You could probably plan a trip across country using the locations that Gardner so beautifully and lovingly describes. Uh, Lisa's descriptions are breathtaking, whether explaining emergency boxes in San Francisco or sad aquariums in Denver or Cape Cod, parts of Cape Cod falling into the ocean. Um, it is clearly a beautifully and lovingly written book. And to me, it's not just a simple travelogue or a quest, but it's actually also something a little bit more complex. And I'm not even sure if, if Lisa's picked it up, but it's a story of a physical scientist coming to grips with the most complex sciences that we know, which is the study of people, their cultures, communities, and societies, and the relationships they have with disasters, uncertainty, and climate change. So Lisa, welcome to the wild, wild, wild world of social science. I'm glad that you're with us and that you're on our side. And thank you so much for the book. Um, now, I'm just going to go through some of my impressions as I was reading the chapters. So the introduction really brings the reader to the uniqueness um, of the focus of the writer uh, and an obsession with disasters and something that a lot of people in this room share and, and almost I don't, I, I don't know if this is the best term, but fetishizing nature uh, of scientists have towards disasters. And the first section really explores uncertainty and explains to people how scientists approach this work. As something of a scientist myself, I found this approach um, to my work quite illuminating as well. I also enjoyed uh, Gardner's examination of Le Petit Prince, which is a favorite book of mine. Uh, I read it a lot as a child. And I particularly enjoyed her encouragement of the readers to freely enjoy the internet's lack of respect of copyrights. So score one for Gardner on that one. Um, uh, one question I did have from the introduction is that I'm not sure that we can say this definitively um, in terms of whether or not people will go and analyze a drawing 
especially a child's drawing from a scientific perspective. People are really busy, they have other priorities, and a child's imagination may not gain priority for the needs of the adult. Therefore, they may not consider it worthy of scientific assessment. Second of all, I think it's a really important to understand that scientists are people, and the scientific method is just one way of knowing about the physical world. And my experience working with scientists, as I have done for almost 15 years in, in my as a communication practitioner and a researcher, is that scientists don't always apply the scientific method to all the different types of challenges and situations they come across. Um, sometimes scientists are incredibly emotional about their work, uh, whether they want to admit it or not. Uh, so I, I, I found that a little bit interesting to parse through. From chapter two, I really enjoyed chapter two. I thought it was fascinating, the use of ivory soap. I had no idea that it could help move a lighthouse. Uh, it's a great example of uh, things that you wouldn't think about that have a small thing that has incredible impact. Um, it, there must be some sort of 1990s grunge music lyric in that story somewhere, but uh, it's an excellent point, I think, about how a community rallied together when the threat of the lighthouse with boat was both eminent, but it wasn't just about the physical structure that was under threat, but how people perceived it as a connection to their history. And so the solution, while difficult, and I, I can't even think about the engineering complexities of moving this heavy lighthouse, was, pos was possible and actionable. I loved the story because it provided so much hope. And it talked about how much a community cares about things that impact the community. Whereas the little house by itself, without somebody really championing that house on its own, on a cliff, uh, came down. Um, and I think that there's just a really beautiful analogy there. The third chapter, uh, which deals with San Francisco 1906, which uh, of course I do obviously really uh, enjoy reading about earthquake literature, compared and contrasts the events of the previous story. I find this a really interesting historical discussion, particularly around people's responses and behaviors. I, I, I found that tension there um, quite interesting on how we look at historically what people did in 1906. And uh, Gardner talks about how people were sort of sitting there and having cups of tea and looking down at the destroyed city and sort of coping with it. Um, and and how, how people approach their responses in that, that earthquake. Um, as we, I went along, one of the things I really noted was how Gardner discovered the West's risks. And as a, as a West Coast person my whole life, I, I found her conversation around discovering how different it is from, uh, and sometimes more of a hostile place than back East, for instance. For those of us who are from here, we know too well the risks that we uh, take when we go out to the back country, or even risks of running uh, with threats of running out of gas on a hot day in the middle of the summer, miles from pe where people are. We understand those risks. And I found it really interesting as Gardner was discovering it for herself about coming to terms with this uh, intimidating at time environment. So real writing talent, I find, comes from exploring issues that I personally don't find professionally interesting at all, but I found fascinating in the hands of Lisa, particularly on the lionfish. I found the whole, this whole chapter absolutely enthralling, particularly how communities engage to get rid of these beautiful but troublesome fish. Uh, fish and tropical uh, life sort of remain a topic in chapter five, which is exploring the differences between Oceanside and Central, uh, central Living Aquariums. Uh, water seemed to be a particular theme, particularly in chapter six, uh, as and seven with uh, flooding in Colorado. And I have to say, I think my favorite chapter has to deal with the magic eight ball. Um, I loved this because my favorite aftershock forecaster of all time, Dr. Andy Michael has a magic eight ball in his office and has done so for years. And when we talk about aftershock forecasts, of course, he has his numbers, he has his statistics, but he also has his beloved magic eight ball. And we talk about the magic eight ball a lot. This discussion, Lisa, was wonderful, um, particularly exploring the tricky spaces between probabilities, forecasting, and how people understand these things. I really didn't want this particular chapter to end. Um, space, I found that really great too. Um, and I enjoyed the write-up, but space isn't much of my thing. So I sort of, you know, kind of looked over that one, read it through. I enjoyed the conversation about um, us having not a second planet and, and to think about space as, as a hope, but that we should protect what we have here. So overall, it's a lovely book. It's nicely composed. I found the book much more hopeful and pleasant than other books that I've read in the space. And I think this is exactly what we need right now. We need hope and humor and kindness and the belief that things uh, will be better um, and can become better 
if we do something about it together as a community. And I think this book represents a great start towards that conversation of approaching climate change issues, not just as, as this unmovable thing that we can't do anything about, but actually small communal actions can really make a huge difference, like using ivory soap to help move a lighthouse. So there's little I really want to critique with Lisa, but I really just wanted to engage with a series of questions. So the first is, who would gain most from reading and engaging with this material and this book? One of the things that I found interesting is, is that I read it both as a social scientist, but also somebody who works with scientists. And is this a great primer to help physical scientists understand some of the things that social scientists have been saying for decades and the research that we've been doing for decades and helping transfer them from uh, just getting the numbers right, as Fishoff always talks about, to actually engaging with people in meaningful and emotional ways that actually help them and encourage uh, uh, action. Uh, second of all, um, given that the book was published in 2018, I wanted to know how Lisa would write this book now and what chapters she would add from her wonderful observation and keen eye. What concepts have held out over time and what concepts um, need a second look. So those are my main questions for Lisa. I hope I didn't go over time. Um, and again, Lisa, uh, while I cannot personally in endorse the book, I can say that I did personally enjoy it very much and thank you for your wonderful writing. Thank you so much, Sarah. And a round of applause for you. Thank you for your um, detailed, insightful comments. And I, I loved that what resonated with you so much was that emotion that Lisa originally talked about and that that was the piece that really came across to you in the writing as well. Um, next up, we are going to hear from Francisca Santana. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this panel and for the prompting of um, reading this incredible book. I'm really excited to be able to discuss it with all of you, uh, along with its author, uh, Dr. Lisa Gardner. And while reading the book, it was really a true pleasure to be transported um, across time and place to examine various events, and from them learn why, um, what may be either driving or holding back our ability to respond to the looming threat of climate change. Um, and so for me, as a researcher, uh, the book was a really excellent opportunity to step back from the details of the research I do and think about the universality of human experience with environmental disaster. Um, in many ways, climate change poses really novel threats, but as Lisa argues, and I agree, we already have access to an abundance of knowledge about how humans have responded to, recovered from, and prepared for environmental change throughout history that can help us to act more effectively in the face of climate change. Um, so with my time, I'd like to speak about just two themes related to psychological concepts um, that appeared throughout the book and how I've reflected on those themes. And I'll conclude with just a few thoughts on the role of optimism when addressing climate change. So um, first, Gardner mentions the importance of this two ways the human brain processes information. Um, one is analytic, which processes data and facts, and the other emotional, that in a way uh, reacts instead of responds. And to this binary, I actually wanted to add and highlight the importance of the social world and how we may use both the analytic and emotional parts of our brain to engage with what others are doing around us and how those social interactions can help us to infer the best actions to take. Um, so in the book, uh, a few of you mentioned um, the instance of uh, the eliminators on, uh, on Bonaire who are working to stem the lionfish invasion. And um, I was thinking about this example and how you know, this is an example of groups of people who were motivated to action and I wondered if there could be some type of social influence at play. So although many of the individuals there might have been motivated to eliminate lionfish because you know, they knew about the threat to corals or um, other marine life, it's also possible that some of the eliminators and that motivation uh, involved social norms. So some social expectations could have been a motivator for some of the individuals to get involved in the effort. 
Um, and social norms are of great interest to me in my research uh, on how individuals make sense of and respond to wildfire smoke. So recent wildfires um, in the West have, in just the past few years, exposed millions of people to really extreme levels of air pollution. And for those of you who, who lived, some of, uh, lived through some of this, um, you may remember in those first few years, 2017, 18, and 19, that these events were really shocking and novel and people were very uncertain about what actions to take to protect themselves from smoke. Um, and my colleagues and I have found in our research that in moments of uncertainty like this, people often look to one another to understand and make sense of the threat. So in this case, uh, social norms were really important. Um, and that's where we infer the standards of best behavior by observing what people are doing around us. So for example, wearing a face mask outside uh, during smoking conditions is a really publicly visible act. So one can just infer by looking around and going for a walk, whether or not the majority of the community is wearing a mask to protect themselves. So just in addition to a lot of the, um, the other important psychological concepts that Dr. Gardner highlights, I just wanted to add that social context, um, perhaps in the form of norms, uh, could be an avenue through which we can better understand, and in some cases, um, you know, understand why some people choose to act and, and others don't. Um, and I also found uh, reflections of another really fascinating concept in, in several of Gardner's case studies, uh, what a psychologist called place attachment. And place attachment can be understood as that emotional bond between a person and a place, and increasingly is of great interest to social scientists who want to understand if place attachment may be linked to um, place protective action or climate mitigation behavior. So in the example of the group on Cape Cod, um, uh, Gardner asks, you know, what caused people to recognize this risk and take action? Um, and as, as several of you have pointed out, um, part of this was because uh, people valued the lighthouse beyond its function. It was part of history. Um, and, and I think it's quite possible that these individuals had an emotional bond to the lighthouse. It had um, you know, meaning because it held memories of stories and of past. Um, and so in this way, I was also quite grateful for um, Gardner's introspection and recounting of her own experience with the 2013 floods in and around Boulder. Because I think as we um, all begin to accumulate our own you know, firsthand personal experiences with climate change disasters, we can become more aware of the ways that our emotional bonds to places and communities can spur us to action. Um, but also just on the place attachment topic, incidentally on Cape Cod, there's a really interesting example of sort of the inverse happening. Um, so some people have actually suggested that place attachment may be why residents on the island oppose the construction of a wind farm uh, called Cape Wind, which as far as I know has been entirely scrapped. Um, and so in that case, people on the island who, who claim to support climate mitigation efforts we're not willing to allow it in their backyard. Um, so we can see that place attachment among residents, uh, although it can be a very powerful motivator, uh, does not necessarily guarantee that the outcome will be pro-climate. Um, and so just to conclude, I, I wanted to um, speak a little bit of, about optimism. I really appreciated the conclusion in the book about the important role of techno-optimists and pessimists in, in um, how we've envisioned our futures in the past. And, um, you know, in some cases we've, we've written stories or we've created really dystopian future worlds. Um, I can't help but think of the way people compared um, the bright orange sky of San Francisco during the uh, 2020 wildfire smoke event to the dystopian future that was painted in, in Blade Runner. Um, but I find myself really personally torn on this topic. You know, is it more motivating to think about the negative, to think about, you know, think through the terrible future we want to avoid? Or is it better to emphasize optimism and 
success stories. Um, and I think much like Dr. Gardner, I see the value of both approaches. And I find myself increasingly drawn towards optimism, um, which doesn't necessarily need to focus on you know, nature dominating technology, but can really center examples of human cooperation and inclusivity. Um, so as an example in the ocean space, an increasingly popular approach is to uh, not just focus on the doom and gloom of endangered species, but also to highlight bright spots or hope spots um, where humans have successfully reversed or mitigated harms to say coral reefs. Um, and I also see optimism, for example, in Hawaii to create community based sustainable fishing areas where indigenous Hawaiian communities set the rules of fishing behavior to promote sustainability and care for the resource. Um, and I also see it in the growing focus on understanding the unequal impacts of climate hazards on vulnerable and marginalized groups. Um, because I think by involving more people, especially those who have deep, meaningful connections to nature in the development of climate solutions, um, I think we have a better chance of, of leveling up from the actions of the individual, which are incredibly important, to the collective action uh, that can really meet the scale and scope of um, the impacts that climate change will bring. So, thank you. I'm very excited for the discussion. Thank you so much, Francisca, and what a wonderful way to end our comments from expert speakers. I really appreciated how you added to themes and offered counter examples as a way to further probe what is happening in Lisa's book. So we will turn it back to Lisa for a moment for just a few minutes to give her a chance to comment on our expert comments. <laughs> well, so I, I'm told I have seven minutes to comment on what everyone just so expertly articulated. Um, and so that is clearly not enough time. But um, but there were a few things that I, I wrote down and, and highlighted here when uh, Madeline noted that we need more narrative stories about the people who plan and prepare and avoid disaster because no one even knew that you know it might be a possibility. And I'd love to see ways to frame that that is engaging. I mean, the, you know, like not sitting around boardrooms making decisions based on pro and con lists. And, you know, like how do we, <laughs> how do we make that sort of story um, uh, sitting on the edge of your seat? And, and I think that uh, it's sort of human nature to want that, that story that is like, but how are they gonna save the world? And it's like, well, through careful planning and preparation. And I, I couldn't agree more, but I, um, I also, I just, I don't know what to do about it, but I love the idea. Like what could Chicken Little have done if he wasn't just running around saying, the sky is falling, you know, like that, um, that would make for a great story. So thank you for that. And then um, let's see, what was it? That hope came up several times. So I wanted to speak to that uh, in particular. And um, I think that in, in the world today, probably within this workshop, but definitely with outside of it too, there is a lack of hope. Um, and that's kind of across the board. It's not just a climate change thing or other disasters. It's uh, it's just a, a, a huge, um, there's a huge hope deficit. And, um, and so I, I really, I kind of in this book went towards stories where I could see hope. And, um, and that was, as uh, those of you who have read it, you know, mentioned, um, that is not necessarily the big things. It could be as small as, hey, ivory soap can move a lighthouse. Um, you know, it could be these small little things. Um, I, I also uh, recognize that hope isn't necessarily always doing the right thing at the right time um, perfectly, that hope can look like uh, a person making mistakes and then trying to recover from them. That, you know, when we talk about resilience, um, or when I talk about resilience with 
education audiences, I'm often trying to make sure people know it's not that you're doing everything perfectly and so nothing goes wrong. It could mean that everything is going completely wrong, but that you can bounce back. And I think especially for young people, this is incredibly important to learn. <laughs> so the first time they see an F on a paper, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It means they have more to bounce back from. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, you know, that hope theme is definitely something that uh, I'm, I mean, sometimes I struggle to find it, but I'm always on the search for it. And, um, and that is definitely not a false hope, but like, you know, a, well, when is hope ever false? But like, it, I mean, you know, not, not a hope that is um, unwarranted, uh, not a, I'm sure it'll be fine kind of hope, um, but rather, you know, something that's truly just a little nugget of joy. And um uh, Lily was talking about our, our past history with citizen science, and that's one place where I do really see hope that uh, and the communities that Francisca was talking about, the social situations, those um, lionfish hunters uh, in Bonaire that she referred to, these are just average citizens of the island of Bonaire. And, um, but what they have in common is that they all love scuba diving and they love scuba diving because they all love coral reefs. And so there's a community of people and they, um, they brought this all together into this citizen science project where they were going to help save the reefs through hunting lionfish. And so that, you know, that sort of um, grassroots organizing is really inspiring to me and I think brings a lot of hope too. And so, yeah, I, I guess, um, and I don't know how many people here in this Zoom can relate, but, you know, sometimes in the, in the topics that we talk about and things like that, sometimes, you know, the gloom and the doom can dominate and it is important to find where the hope lies, um, especially if you're communicating with the public um, and, in my case, especially if you're communicating with young people and you want them to know the world is not going to end. Um, very important. So let's see. Oh, there was one question uh, that Sarah asked, I think. How would I write this book now? Well, I've been doing a lot of presentations about how COVID would <laughs> relates to um, uh, relates to all this. And I have to say, it's almost too soon. Like I vetoed a lot of hazards and disasters because it was too soon. I'm not an ambulance ch chaser, literally, or we figured if we like this was um, to have this kind of um, philosophical ex exploration. I mean, you can't be chasing current events exactly, but, uh, but of course it's on all our minds. And it was exactly the same situation where people are saying, is this going to affect me? How is this going to affect me? And, and Francisco's like, you know, uh, sort of mentioned masks and let's look around. Are my neighbors masked at the grocery store? Like what, you know, what do I need to do and what am I supposed to do? And there were definitely examples of people who uh, did a great job at communication and people who didn't do a great job at communication. But then there were also lots of examples of humans going their own route because that's what we do. Um, and so that, you know, it, it's definitely an example that uh, if this book was published in 2018 and had to be delayed just a touch so I could acknowledge that there was a precedent that I didn't plan um, on including. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that, you know, it was four years ago and, um, and there's certainly more examples. And I, I guess I hope that there's less of them in the future, but that's not realistic. Um, there's always going to be more examples coming up. I think that's my seven minutes. Wow. You, Did I have more to say? <laughs> you know, in terms of everybody being super on time. So at this point, I would like to thank you, Lisa, so much for your responses to everyone's comments. Well, and thank you to everyone. I just, uh, I really appreciate, I mean, it's sort of like being in a book club, um, but it was my book. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And we are going to make it even more of a book club at this point because I would like to open up um, and invite everybody to please share your questions. If you feel comfortable, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question directly. And I have saved the comments from the chat 
in case um, we prefer to do that way. But let me pause for a second to give anyone who wants to a chance to unmute and get to ask directly. Hi, Betty. Hi. Hi, so my name is Margaret Adams. I was actually one of the, uh, oh, I don't, I turned on my camera, but apparently I told it no earlier. Uh, anyway, I was one of the book club members um, for this uh, forum. And I just, first of all, I just wanted to say, thank you guys so much for suggesting this book. It was really exciting. Lisa, you're an excellent writer. Oh. Um, and I, so the one thing that I thought was kind of interesting is that in your book, you're exploring you know, all of the disasters that happen and the context in which they're happening. And then you get to the part about the aquarium and you express some sort of like, came off to me as like pish pa who wants mermaids in their aquarium but you know when I was when I was reading that section and I was thinking about the ways that we connect with nature right because if we're not connected and we don't see our place in it we're not as likely to, to take the issues of climate change and uh, mitigation seriously I thought myself personally that having mermaids in an aquarium is a wonderful thing because for so many kids right sharks are scary or jellyfish look weird, but a mermaid, you know what a mermaid's supposed to look like. And you immediately <laughs> have these like fascination, you know, as a kid, I know I was like, well, I can't wait till I turn into a mermaid, right? Like I'm going to go frolic in the ocean. And so I, I see the idea of inviting children to um, embrace the magical and the, the mythical and sort of the wonder of the ocean through adding things like mermaids to these exhibits. I understand where you're coming from. It's totally not real, but you know, for that seven-year-old who's in the ocean, who sees the connection with the fuzzy animals and, and the mermaids and the things, getting them just one step closer to seeing where they could fit in or where they should fit in to this environment that we're trying to protect, to me, seems like a, a great opportunity. It's why we have all those enrichment pieces at the zoos, right? People like to see tigers playing with balls, but the tigers are also bored, and so it's a good one. Madeline, I love that your kid wanted to be a snail. I hope she I hope she accomplishes her dreams. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, I, anyway, really, so I love that. And I, I think you're right. I mean, if we're going to really see ourselves within nature, why not see a mermaid within the ocean? Um, I think the, I mean, my my educator hat tells me, how do we correct that um, misinterpretation at some point so that you know, kids are not asking, did mermaids go extinct? How come they're, you know, like, I mean, how, when, at what stage do we need to make sure it's understood that that's not real? But, um, but it, you're, you've got a good point there. It, it's a way of seeing ourselves as a part of the system with fins. And thank you so much, Margaret, for your comment and for being part of our book clubs. Um, I will open up for more questions because I know that it's fun to get to talk directly to experts. While we're waiting, I will mention that my daughter wants to be a mochi, the dessert. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually the snack I was eating earlier. So. Ah. <laughs> and your daughter wants to be a snail? <laughs> she, she's older now, so she realizes that that dream is not achievable. But there was one point when I asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up, and she was clear that it was a snail. I and she was her. clear that she understood the question, too, because at first I was like typical mom of like, did you even understand what I asked? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think she has a great sense of taste as someone who used to study sales. <laughs> so cute. Okay, let me paste in a question from our chat. This comes from Marla Petal. And she said, I'm worried that risk drops us into the black hole of probability, higher math, and do not compute. Um, and then... She, she, this is, I guess is more of a comment that she said that now she only brings up that now that every day the big one doesn't happen, it brings us one day closer to deterministic risks. Right. Uh, um, so I, okay, I'm going to throw this question out to the field here because I feel like there's a lot of people in this space who could answer this. Um, but I, I have, I had this conversation once with a a researcher from NCAR who will remain nameless. Um, he's not there anymore. But he uh, he told me, no, risk is an equation. It's math. 
you, you don't need any emotions about it. There's no feeling, there's no, you know, like people just need to understand the math better. And, um, you know, it, the, it's an equation. There's, there's absolutely no um, humanity to it really at all. And I, I was just like perplexed, you know, but how can, you know, cause I was asking him, well, how can we communicate risk without any math? And um, he was like, well, that's impossible. It's like saying, how do you make a refrigerator work without electricity? You know, like it just seemed uh, to, in his mind to make absolutely no sense. So I, I'd love to hear various perspectives on this. I'm not sure if this is the forum for it, but I, um, I, I feel like we need a way to communicate risk or, or multiple ways to communicate risk because not everyone understands through the same ways of learning, um, multiple ways to communicate risk that do not involve equations um, or you know, maybe one with equations for people who like that. But like it, um, having having various methods would be really helpful. And then the whole, um, the big one, then the big one comes and I, I think um, I have, uh, have kids uh, do this activity about flash floods ever since the flood in Boulder about the hundred year flood. And they have bags, paper bags full of beads, a hundred beads and one is a different color and they need to, you know, pick out, you know, 10 and then pick out 10 again for the next year. And they see, does that bead, that one bead get picked out, um, you know, every hundred years? Like how, how often do you pick out that bead? And it turns out like some groups will have that bead never picked out and some will pick it out five times. And so anything that we can do to, I mean, that's a middle school activity, but how, anything we can do to make that experiential for people without actually experiencing the hazard would be really helpful. Like if there's, if there's ways that we can communicate that sense of um, even just simple online games or things like that, like um, if you roll the die 10 times and you know, what are your chances of getting a one, you know, like, did that equal what you actually got? And I think, you know, having those sorts of experiences, people can relate to those more than the, um, you know, 100 year flood risk, for instance. I, I would like to, uh, this is Marla, um, I would like to um, suggest that we not go down the probability and rolling dice route because we know very clearly that um, that risk is not, um, uh, uh, you know, it's not a matter of chance. And so that that really sends us down the black hole. Oh, does it? Okay, and, so that's not a good math, idea. You know, that the people who've researched our understanding of math are absolutely clear that probability and risk are higher math and people have a very, very hard time computing it. So I, I just, that's why with earthquake risk, I, I just went away from it. I mean, my, my example was that, you know, when in, in, in uh, Turkey, they were using our 30 year um, risk framework, which comes from our mortgage uh, period. And we said, well, why are you using 30 years? That means nothing in Turkey. So they switched it to 50 years because that's at least a generation. And of course, the percentage went up a teeny, teeny bit between 30 and 50. And but the public, when we said, oh, we've, you know, the risk is now expressed this way, said, oh, phew, 50 years. So that's not what they didn't hear anything about the risk. They heard 30 years and 50 years. And so I just think that is a, a place not to go. I think, you know, that the thing that we have to communicate is this is happening now and only certain actions will avert the consequences. Are you talking about climate change in particular, not well, other sorts you know, of hazards? I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about, about earthquakes or climate, the principle of the thing is, is the problem is the same. The mm -hmm. whole formulation of risk, yeah, we, we took that on hook, line and sinker from the engineers because that's the way their brains work. And that's great for people with you know higher education degrees whose brains work that way. And for mm -hmm. everybody else, it's not working. So when you say this is happening here right now, I mean, there, if there isn't an earthquake in progress right now, people are probably going to think you're chicken little. Uh, how do you, like, what, what do you want to well, so, tell so the message, So the message that I, I use is simply this area has a, a high earthquake risk, and therefore every day it doesn't happen brings us one day closer. So that they can then relate it emotionally to this is if this doesn't hit me, it's going to hit my children or my grandchildren. So we can 
actually then start to inhabit and do the time travel stuff that you're talking about. So, I mean, I think that's very helpful. Yes, let us use our imaginations to time travel to the end of our own lives and our children's lives and our grandchildren. And that's where the emotion, the emotional space is and the motivation space is for us to do something. Thank you, Marla. Let's hear from Sarah McBride because I think you have uh, some thoughts. Yeah, and, and I, I mostly agree with Marla with the exception of when these events are actually occurring, like the aftershock forecast where you know, we put out aftershock forecasts and probabilities and how we package them and, and put them out there. Those things are asked for by our community members. They want to see those. They want to see numbers. They want to see those contextualized because they're actually going through that experience at the time. And they mm -hmm. want to have something that explains what's going to happen next to them for them. And that that is something that you have to consider. And, uh, you know, particularly when it is occurring, if we have that information, we need to give that information. That is that is mm -hmm. part of part of an ethical mandate to give that information and how we package it. We do, we do a lot of different things with the aftershock forecast at the USGS, but yeah, I mean, I think I think it depends where people are at in terms of their relationship to the mm -hmm. hazard and I, and and that's to their a good risk. point. Yeah, and you've got a like a very engaged audience by that point, Sarah, because like they <laughs> they're clued exactly. in exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I mean, there there is absolutely a, a time and a place for. I, I think for these kinds of probabilities, mm -hmm. but it's where they're at in terms of their understanding and their and their readiness to receive that information. So I'm I mostly absolutely agree with you, Marla. But but just being aware that people are at different phases at different times in their experiences with these kinds of events, and sometimes people are really hungry for information when they're when it's when it's not just an abstract idea when it's actually in their face and they're living through that experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sarah. I want to give a second to get to this question from Trisha. So Trisha Sears was asking about how strong do you feel the element is of people feeling that they can't do something about natural hazards versus man-made disasters? And we'd love to hear from the panel uh, what your response is to that question. I know it's a longer question, but I put someone, it in. Uh, someone brought up uh, this during the panel, and I can't remember who, and I, um, I'd i love to hear a little bit more about, was that Madeline? I think it might you? have been me. Um, yeah. I mean, because I did bring it up, but there may have been someone else who did. <laughs> but I, so I think that that's part of it, but I think it's actually even worse than that, maybe. Um, sorry, I'm the pessimist today, I guess, but but I think it's that people don't even necessarily think we should do something. So it's, it's maybe even more than can, right? It's should we do about something about something that's natural versus should we do something about it because it's man-made? Um, and I, you know, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, anyway, I, I think that's, um, that's what it comes down to more than the, the can, but I don't know, maybe there, there are lots of researchers on this call. So maybe there is research on the, on the can part as well. I can just add quickly, I, um, I don't know much about research that's looked at man-made versus um, like natural hazards necessarily, but I do know that this point that Trisha is getting at, right, that like um, how um, strongly people feel that the actions they're taking are effective. So like very, making like the efficacy of actions very concrete and really connecting the action to uh, reducing the threat, that that is, at least in, in the literature I'm familiar with is, is actually very um, important and in some ways can actually predict action more effectively than, than threat perception. So people who have a really high perception of the risk of something, but don't know or, or can't like really concretely connect their action to reducing the threat, may be less likely to do something. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of highlight that. I mean, there's, uh, you know, the, um, not the mechanics, but the kind of um, psychology involved in making games, having, uh, having a reaction when you've achieved something in a game um, is more motivating than for you to keep doing that and trying to make that happen again. Whereas games that don't give you that kind of feedback don't give you, um, and I'm speaking in analogies again, because that's what I do. So the my point is that um, when there's an action you can take, like wearing a mask to avoid COVID, you're not going to get any sort of 
you know, bing, you got a point, you know, there's no, um, there's no carrot that you got for doing that. There's nothing visible, um, like a moved lighthouse. There's nothing uh, tangible, like a hundred dead lead fish. There's, um, there's just you wearing a mask. And so that can be a real challenge with hazard communication and, and any sort of um, communication for people to take actions to avoid something bad, like they're, you know, their carrot is to not have something bad happen like that. That's just a, a taller order <laughs> for people. And uh, I mean, it, it's I'm not sure there's much we can do about it, but uh, it's just harder that way. Well, I also think all this sort of speaks again to the to the need to split our audiences better. Right. And I think everything yeah. tells us we need to do that. But then we end up sort of talking about the general public as though that's a thing. Right. 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 Um, but they really aren't a thing. Um, mm -hmm. We're all very different. Um, and the same message that might get me to take an action is very different from the message that's going to get, you know, my neighbor or someone across town to take an action. Absolutely. And you all are ahead of us because you answered Simran's question, which I think was pretty much exactly on this topic as I interpret it. So I'd love to highlight Tafa's question here, and uh, I will read it out. In the early 2000s, the Pacific Territories would talk about climate change and the impact amongst the disability community. Although many did not believe this in the mainland, it was an experience of the rural remote communities away from the majority. How can we take the stories shared from the Pacific Islands at face value instead of waiting until we experience it ourselves to believe it? Some may view this as political, but what is political in the mainland is not political in the territories. I guess I'm really interested in, to know these stories. And I, I think, um, and this speaks to, I, I'd really like to see more storytelling and more storytelling from, from the people personally affected by this, but also um, in ways that can help, you know, all sorts of people feel like what it's like to be them and in their place and in their shoes. And I think that um, that, that type of storytelling really can, breed empathy. And I, that's, you know, one, one thing that I, I really wish there was more of, and, um, and it doesn't have a very large space in this, this kind of world, but I, I'd love to see more of that happening. Absolutely, Lisa. And I've, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lily. Well, yeah, I, I also wanted to comment on that. Tafa did message me and say that she had to leave to teach a class. Um, oh. And she apologizes for not being able to stay to ask that question in person, but also um, being someone who's familiar with her work and her work, particularly with those with developmental disabilities. Um, I think this is such an important point to highlight in terms of subverting the narrative by, you know, looking at climate change as not just a macro problem that affects this planetary scale, but um, at the individual level, how people can respond and, and the vulnerable communities that it tends to affect. Um, and islands in particular being very isolated, very remote and often overlooked when it comes to climate narratives and flipping that narrative and having them be more central to the conversation um, as these places that always, al almost always see themselves in relationship to something else, which is a, a continental location. Um, in many ways, islands are prone to the, the larger effects of climate change when it comes to sea level rise and, and flooding, um, and also exhibit some of the best practices that many more communities um, should be paying attention to in order to mitigate some of climate challenges. And so I, I kind of wanted to echo Tafa. I do not mean to speak for her, but I am familiar with what she does. So I wanted to at least add a little bit to, to that question as a context wrapper. Thank you so much, Lily, and for, for sharing the context around Tifa's question. And I do feel like these um, issues around narratives tie really nicely to Alexa's question, which um, at the bottom of it, it's about how do we make climate change feel more of an immediate issue while there are so many other issues that people are dealing with on a daily basis. Yeah, that, that is tough. And I, um, I think, uh, I mean, I referred to it, I, I can't remember whose work this was, I was referencing in the book, but 
um, there's the analogy of the basket of worries. And if your basket of worries is totally full, you don't have room for things um, like climate change necessarily, or maybe you did have it in your basket, but then you got a terrible like medical diagnosis. So climate change went out the window and you're going to have to commute, you know, in your SUV to these doctor appointments or something that um, your worry basket does get overflowing at some times. And, and so there are so many other issues that people see. And um, I do see anecdotally um, in, in my work as an educator, I do see an incredible like sort of groundswell of um, interest in climate change around times when there have been natural disasters that are linked to climate change. And so like the uh, wildfires on the West Coast a couple of years ago, the um, when the hurricanes are stronger than, than usual and that makes it into the press, then we get surges of web traffic on our website about like, well, what, is there a connection between hurricanes and climate change? And, you know, like that people want to know those things. So in a way those, you know, it's the system of like, you know, the disasters and climate change and people's understanding of all those things are all sort of knit together. But of course, you know, we, we don't hope for more disasters so that there's more public understanding. <laughs> and if you're coping with a disaster, if you're actively in it, then you don't have a lot of room in your worry basket for um, stopping a, a global scale catastrophe of climate change. So that that is something that I feel like, you know, in the next few decades, as we get more and more of those small scale disasters, it's going to limit our people's bandwidth for dealing with the larger one. Um, and uh, that that's a concern. <laughs> if I if I might add a little something to that, because I, I think um, when you were talking, Lisa, I was reminded of some some work that's still preliminary, but that we're, we're uh, funding with um, University of Oklahoma and Hank Jenkins Smith and Carol Sola's group. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that they have found looking at, they're doing a project for us on wildfire and helping us understand some of our audience needs on wildfire smoke. Um, but one of the things like very preliminary finding they, they, they had was that uh, almost all the times that a hazard of wildfire smoke is mentioned, there is no mention of impact. And there is, it's like one in a hundred mention and action you can take, right? And so I think there's a lot more that we can do. Mm -hmm. And this is looking at social media metrics, but they're going to do Interesting. a story yeah. too. But there's a lot more that we can do just to start linking those things in people's mm -hmm. minds so that if it mm -hmm. is in their worry back at basket, they know how to worry effectively, right? Um, <laughs> well, there's if, something they could do and maybe worry less. And yeah, right. that would be great. Right. So just linking that hazard yeah. the impact into the action is, is going to be critical. Great idea. Sarah? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say that that sounds like a fantastic study. We've done something a little bit different. We looked at museum exhibits across the United States regarding earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And we looked at over 150 museum exhibits and only about 27 included any preparedness or protective actions that people could take in earthquakes or earthquake shaking. And only two mentioned earthquake early warning. Um, and I work on earthquake early warnings. That was a little bit heartbreaking. But the there was a lot of disconnect between um, what we're producing for the public, what we're, and there is no general public, there's many publics um, with segmented publics theory. But for people who are going to museums and free choice learning environments, there's very little that's actually specific that helps them understand what their experience is gonna be and what they can do about it. Um, we tend to go into like, let's just scare people about how terrible it is and then good luck. <laughs> it's very, it, wow. it, it feels very um, sort of like, again, just missed opportunities and how we're looking, how we're contextualizing where we can make um, interventions and putting out information for people who really want it and are engaged because they've just gone through a whole exhibit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm assuming those exhibits were in areas that are earthquake prone. Is they were all over. We oh, we, all over. we looked we looked very broadly um, mm. all over. We we did um, overlay it for our next paper on the national hazard seismic model um, mm. to take a look at it. And obviously there are more where there's higher seismicity, but we did look in places where there's actually not a lot of earthquakes. Um, mm. Because you know people are interested in earthquakes. Sure, they don't yeah. get earthquakes. Um, and and yeah, we found it to be pretty pretty similar with with lack of information. I remember growing up in Massachusetts. I learned what I should do in case of an earthquake. 
that was really helpful knowledge. And <laughs> but that was from the Boston Museum of Science. <laughs> Shout out to them in the 70s. <laughs> well, in our thank you both. And in our last three minutes, I want to piggyback off of Zoe's question to ask everyone on our panel, and I know this is hard to do, but if you could give one suggestion, one take home action that folks here today with us could take, what would that be? It seems ironic to ask for like one action, but that's my ask. <laughs> So I will just um, chime in and, and sort of um, push the, the, the social influence concept and just to, so talk to people, talk to in particular your close friends and family about these issues and what you've learned because um, yeah, people can be influenced, especially by their, their close loved ones. So. I think, um... It's, it's certainly not a simple one-step method, but to find out where people are coming from um, when you're talking to them, which I know is difficult if you're issuing a press release or, you know, or writing a book or whatever, you know, like it's whoever picks it up. But, um, but knowing, knowing who you're talking to and what, what they care about um, and what will sway them. <laughs> Maybe I'll add, um, you don't need 100% consensus to take action and, and do something. It doesn't need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll go next just because I, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'll be optimistic enough to be the closing, to close out the let's <laughs> everything else. Um, I, I think my takeaway is it's gonna be hard, but we all have to do it, right? I mean, this is the future of the planet, right? And so I think all of these, these comments on, on the need to better understand the social systems, to better engage the communities that we're talking about in their own solutions. Um, you know, these are some of the hardest things for, for government bureaucrats and scientists to do, right? We've, we've not succeeded at this in the past, but we've got to succeed here. So we've got to, we've got to just work towards it um, because that's the only way forward. I guess that leaves it to me to round it up. Hi. <laughs> um, thanks. No, no pressure, Madeline. Um, I think I think we need to see the light in the in the darkness right now and think about humor, think about great stories, about success, about engaging on a very community level because communities move lighthouses with ivory soap. I don't know how much they use, but they obviously use a lot. And and to be hopeful that this is something we can do because we don't have an option. We have to do it. So um, yeah, let's let's look at hope in the future and, and in the present as well. Thank you all so much for being put on the spot. And I see that we are past time. So I will close out this session. Thank you all so much. And thank you to everyone here for joining us today. Thank you so much, Betty. Thank you, it was fun. Absolutely. Nice to meet you all. This was great. Thank you. Madeline, are you still on? Yes, I'm still here. I'm, I'm here for beers if you want to like <laughs> <laughs> later uh, as a fellow Fed or something. <laughs> no. No, we, we, should, we should get together sometime. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Madeline, Sarah, and Lisa. Uh, this See, is now that the just, now that the beer dates oh, have been made, you. I am <laughs> going to go ahead and end this uh, session. Thank you everyone for coming and especially to our panel and our lauded author, Lisa. This was wonderful. We're so happy to have you. Everybody have a great day and I hope to see you in the next uh, session. Thank you, Julie.